In the 80s of the already past century, there was a taxi driver who lived in Chicago. His name was Josef Polovsky. He was not very young. Having been sick, he left a will. He asked his fellow soldiers to bury him overseas at the cemetery of a little German town in Torgau, on the river Ilva. There was complete huddle on the roads of Europe in the spring of 1945. Battle maps, accurate and logical, could not give even a rough idea of what was going on then. The Germans flee from the war, scared by Goebbels' propaganda, which stated as if the entire population of the country would be deported to Siberia. The liberated concentration camp prisoners are trying to get back to their families. Those who were driven to work for Germany want to get home. Thus, when we were passing through Germany, it was just unbelievable, somehow even inexplicable. When we captured a settlement, people would stand with their hands up, civilians with hands stuck up. That is, they had been told that we would destroy everybody there and so on. But did we really do this? No. We were fighting the army. Once we were approaching a settlement, we were riding horses. It was quite warm and the sun was shining. At the outskirts of the settlement, there were small kids, girls, and a woman. A covey of, say, about 15 to 20 people. Now I don't remember the number exactly. Glad, joyful, smiling. They were holding wildflowers in their hands to greet us. And when we approached them, they all cried out in chorus, Ivan, you son of a bitch. Ivan, you son of a bitch. <laughs> the soldiers howled with laughter. <laughs> but why did they meet us that way? Well, there was an advanced party, a platoon moving ahead of me. I mean, ahead of our squadron. So the inhabitants of the settlement asked the platoon soldiers, there are Soviet troops arriving soon. Would you let us know the best way to greet them? So the soldiers told them exactly what the best way was. The chaos was getting worse. The disbanded army is looking for some entity to yield prisoners to. The prisoners move around almost without any escort. Sometimes there was just one convoy for a thousand disarmed soldiers and officers. Almost everybody was aware of what was going on. Almost. But not everyone. It is the middle of March. Hitler recommends to Guderian to go on vacation. The general responds, my Fuhrer, I will choose a cottage for rest in a place which would not be captured within the next 48 hours. At that same moment, the local wreckers attack on the confectionery plant somewhere in a neighboring town. The Allies find themselves waist deep in sugar and chocolate bars. The tired people rob shops briskly, but at the same time they clean up the streets after fighting in an orderly and careful manner. Boys, I the battle is over. The morning is coming. 
And they immediately start picking up the broken stone and rubbish. A few hours later, the work is over and the pavements are clean. A demolished house is located right over there, but there is neither rubbish nor broken stone around it. Everything has been cleaned up. Well, here I am walking through town and it's so clean that it couldn't possibly be cleaner. There is a woman. She has a bucket, a mop, soapy water, and she is washing the pavement with soap. Afterwards, she would rinse it all down with the clean water, and there you are. The huddle of freedom and the proximity of victory turned the territory of Europe into a huge nomadic camp where no one knows for sure what would happen after the next turn. Some things start getting into a mess at the front, too. Who is at whose side? Who supports whom and why? The chaos gives rise to mistakes and absurd situations that are often unpleasant. For instance, three Englishmen met the Red Army men, all by chance, and they were sent to fight together with our infantry. As they wrote in a statement to their command later on, complaining post factum, that restless evening, the Russians interrogated them, and the officer refused to recognize them as Englishmen, insisting they would inform him about the German division they belonged to. After that, the Brits were sent to a pig pen to spend a night in the company of German prisoners. It's curious that afterwards, the English command who asked for apologies received the following laconic response from the Soviet registry. Your letter is received. But as it is written in a rude and impolite manner, the command will not be informed about it. The Red Army was moving across Europe with such a swiftness which scared the Allies. The soldiers exhausted themselves. They would have reached the Mediterranean Sea and even the Pyrenees. Of course, if they did not open the second front, we would have reached the English Channel. What would we have done over there? The same we did in our own territory. From the moment the Allied forces landed in Normandy, the linking of two armies became inevitable. But the discussion of the Allied forces and the Russians about the capture of Berlin was really frightening. It showed well that the common sense too often gives way to the desire for revenge. When they had a meeting. It was all settled by word of mouth. It was decided back in Yalta how Germany would be divided and where the encounter was to take place. Hitler's reconnaissance obtained part of the information, but the place was kept secret. Each of the armies got precise instructions where they had to stop advancing. But the number of minor actions increased and could escalate into a conflict. Did the soldiers have anything to do with the political ambitions of the upcoming new partition of Europe? The Russians had been afoot for the fourth year. They had survived anger and were reaching the elation of the winners. No one was going to flirt with the Brits or the Americans. However, However, Eisenhower, Stalin, and the Brits, they all realized that the troops were to know for sure where they would meet the Allies. 
This was to happen somewhere not in the field, and what is most important, the meeting was not to turn into a battlefield. Everybody was in fact afraid of the approaching event. It was really not so easy to organize all that in practice. On top of it, the armies had different equipment. The Americans used radios, and Soviet troops worked on wire telephony. But whatever system one used, without speaking each other's language, they could not establish contact which aggravated the mess. They needed some natural borderline. A river was the best choice. The Elba, flowing from the south to the north of the country, the last major natural obstacle on the way to the Allied forces between the Rhine and the Oder, was the most correct river. Considering mutual distrust and different outlooks on the destiny of the world, the politicians were seriously afraid of the outcomes of the meeting. A part of Hitler's top commanders had separate negotiations with the Allies on the variants of the capitulation. Goebbels had already come up with the Iron Curtain term and put it into practice. The idea was to put a fence around civilized Europe to stop the Soviet hordes coming from the east. It casually emerged that as the occupation zones had been divided already, the Americans would soon have to retreat and surrender a part of the territories to the Soviet Union. Hundreds of thousands of people rushed behind the Ilba, being afraid to be liberated by the Soviet troops. By the end of March, Churchill arrived to the Rhine in his airplane. They said that the explosions of the shells falling some meters away frightened the Prime Minister as much as the upcoming linking up with the Russians. Neither he nor Stalin had any illusions regarding the mutual trust, let alone friendship. Letters of instructions were filled with statements of harmful complacency and unnecessary credulity. I served as a buzzer for a platoon communications division, and I had radio operators with me, so we learned everything through the radio. Being communications workers, later on we got accustomed to even the intonations of the command. Well, once we realized from the talks that something incomprehensible was to be prepared, they did not report it to us. But something was going on. So Gordiev sends for me and says, you know what? It's over. We will go not to Berlin, but to Prague. And the troops are starting to move in an absolutely different direction because of that. 
So from there we moved on to Prague. And then from Prague we moved to the Elba. Across the Elba, in fact. Around, say, the 20th of April, the command informed the staff of the division that there could be an encounter with the American troops advancing from Normandy at the River Elba. The prearranged signal for this encounter was a series of red rockets from our side and a series of green rockets from the American side. I seem to remember it was a foggy morning. I am about to... You have to take into account that so many years have passed. At least, it was not a sunny day, only a bit foggy. And so they made their way over there. The company commander Goloborotko went to reconnaissance. Well, Goloborotko went over there to that side. So the senior lieutenant Goloborotko, commander of the 6th company of the 175th Rifle Regiment, generally speaking, it was the first occasion in case to consider the one to be the first born. In other words, two divisions were linked up. They were not linked up in battle, of course. It was a surveillance patrol, and they met in patrol. They crossed the river. In fact, they met some Germans, uh-huh. They just... Well, some division was leaving, actually. Nevertheless, no combat operations took place at that moment. That is for sure. Well, then Goloborodko came back. He reported to the regiment's commanding officer on what and where. Well, we transmitted it all, informing accordingly that the reconnaissance party returned. Goloborodko proved that actually no Germans were found there, that there was just a group of unknown military men dressed in a uniform other than the Soviet one, that those men simply wore different uniforms. Uh. And the second meeting took place in Turgau. It was already after 3 or 4 p.m. How was it? The same, day, the same day, only several hours later, our reconnaissance man, Sergeant Robertson, set out to Turgau. He did not find any German troops there. But at the end of the bank of the river, he discerned soldiers in unfamiliar uniforms. He thought maybe these are Germans who had changed their uniforms to mislead the Americans, still more so that they opened fire at him. and place green antiseptic there and painted a white control flag with it, which he stuck out of one of the windows. The Russians noticed him and without understanding, well, who was engaging in negotiations with them, sent their signals for the Americans, a red rocket. However, they did not get a proper response so that everybody was at a loss. It seemed like no one was shooting, and Robertson went to the bank of the Elba with his self-made identification sign, a flag smeared in green antiseptic. And you 
There he heard someone shouting, Comrade! And then he went on to the destroyed bridge. And the Russian officer, Silvashko, was coming across towards him. Nobody ordered anything of the kind. They simply climbed on that bridge and met. They could not say anything to each other, except they just kept shaking hands. Robertson had a small jeep. He made a suggestion, and the Russian arrived with him to the American unit lines. It was an unauthorized meeting. No one sent him, Robertson, and no one sent Silvashko. But it did happen so. Here is Silvashko and Robertson. This is the photo of the two of them, published in numerous Soviet and American newspapers. Our commander of the Division General Reinhardt said to Robertson, Chap, you got there without an order and put him under detention. Though only for an hour. Soon everybody realized that these guys were the heroes of the day. And how smart he was, that Robertson. One might say that he stole that Russian to prove that the meeting had actually happened. And in the meantime, our secret agents were at full speed investigating the absence of Silvasco from the unit. No kidding, the commander of the platoon went to visit some people in strange uniforms, not informing when he would be back. At first, no contacts were allowed, neither from the American side for the Americans being punished for that, nor for the Soviet side. When Stalin, the Kadma, there was an order issued permitting contacts to commanders of divisions. There was an order issued permitting contacts to the commanders of divisions, corps, and the army commander. A movie is a movie, in fact, and nothing else, nothing else really. The other thing is that, in many cases, everything is much too simplified, and people start thinking this way. My granddaughter believes that the Allies met and hugged each other, and the war was over, and there you are. You know, Americans behaved somehow in a more cheeky way than we usually did. As for us, it was all where to go, how to go, and all of that kind. And they were the freedom. They crossed the river in boats, several men already, 
And they started communicating with us. Friendships and all that, hugs and the other, you see. That was the difference between us and the Russians. Perhaps we had a different attitude to many things. They had a stricter discipline. I don't know how it was with such things as meals. For example, if they tried to serve us yesterday's supper for breakfast, we refused to eat it. We just threw it away and demanded what there had to be according to the regulations. Is it possible with the Russians? I remember once my commander told such a strange story. We didn't know whether we should believe it or not. As if one of the Russians tried to take a bicycle from a civilian German. At the same time, an officer would try to stop that soldier, and then he started shooting at him. What was that? An exaggeration? Propaganda? Misunderstanding of the situation? I don't know. I remember some American even presented me with a cigarette case. I kept it somewhere and then, I don't know, maybe my grandson took it away. Yes, that was it. Things like this, really. And what could we suggest as a present? Maybe a red star from the cap? The other thing was that afterwards, the sergeant major would ask where the star had gone. Oh, yes. Okay. This happens next day. On the 26th, when General Rusakov invited the divisional commander Reinhardt of the 69th Infantry Regiment. That was the beginning of a series of famous parties at the Ilba. The surprise and joy of those several soldiers and officers on the bank of the river who smacked each other's backs were so sincere that the curiosity went over to the superior ranks. They started to pay visits and invite guests in compliance with the titles. Now, if you were lucky... And we drank vodka with the Russians. And when we met the French, we drank Calvados. In Europe, we learned how to drink wine. In France, it was green wine. We did not even understand at first that it was wine. We tasted it only afterwards. What about us, we common American lads? Hadn't drank anything except beer. We didn't have the slightest idea about wine, cognac or vodka or champagne. In one small town, one person of the civilian population, I think they were refugees, showed us the wine cellars in one castle. There were several thousand boxes of this champagne, 12 bottles in each. We loaded about 5,000 bottles into our truck. It was long enough for a month. General Bradley writes in his memoirs, Russian vodka and endless toasts to the victory had knocked down officers of several staff headquarters. But dinners and libation became more and more frequent, and Bradley, slightly puzzled with what was going on, instructed that everyone who went to the Russians had to eat 50 grams of butter on an empty stomach so that they do not fall face first into the Russian borscht. Soviet political bodies, in their turn, informed the personnel well beforehand. 
on the 25th of April and prior to the first toast of the following. The prestige of the dignity of the Russian soldier and officer must be held according to the position occupied. And on the 28th, the order was issued. To the units and detachments, as well as to the soldiers and officers personally, to demonstrate high discipline and competently develop consciousness. Getting ready for the banquet hosted by Marshal Konev, General Bradley ate, farsightedly, some sandwiches with butter and emptied a can of condensed milk at breakfast. And before the departure of the general to the Russian lines, experienced officers who had already visited some joint feasts provided him with a bottle of mineral oil. Swallow this on your way and you would be able to drink anything they pour for you. According to Bradley's recollections, there was plenty of fresh caviar, veal, beef, cucumbers, brown bread, and again some butter on the table of Marshal Konev. Toasts to the big three. To the victory were pronounced, but Bradley was surprisingly lucky. Konev drank white wine, not vodka. Thus, Bradley himself did not have to drink hard alcohol. Konev, in his turn, was surprised that the American general brought copies of operation maps with him, where the troops' disposition was indicated. Konev was shocked. Such information in the Soviet army was considered top secret, and he would never think it possible to share these maps with the Americans. In the evening, when the guests were already leaving the villa, Konev and Bradley went out to the garden. An orderly led out a Don horse with a red star embroidered on the saddle. Konev gave the bridle to Bradley. An inscribed pistol was added to the gift. Anticipating possible exchange of gifts, Bradley brought in his plane a brand new Jeep, which had just arrived from Antwerp. A memorial inscription was made on the bonnet of the truck in English and Russian, and a new short rifle was enclosed with the Jeep. The toolbox was carefully packed with American cigarettes. Still, on his way to this banquet, Bradley was worried that he would face reprimands from the head of the Army Control and Finance Directorate. And still, 20 years after the war, he would have to pay for that. Well, to hell with it, said Bradley. We could not come empty-handed. This was as if the final rehearsal of the victory celebration, and even more, ideal victory. Here at the Ilba, no one neither divided anything nor promised or deceived anybody. The Americans were impressed that there were many women in the Red Army, with medals and always wearing arms, possibly participating in combat operations. Americans discussed. Our officers from their side felt shy sometimes in the presence of chic American canaries.
И вот во время выступления Suddenly, an American actress and singer who was singing the song came up to the spectators. Her commander, General Simpson, and our commander, they were sitting together next to each other. Simpson was without a cap. He was bold. Ours was, as I remember now, in a forage cap. I do not remember well now. But still, she took a kerchief. I don't know what words she was singing, but perhaps according to the lyrics, she put her kerchief onto his head and tied it, you see, as if on a doll. It was strange for us, because for us, anything of the kind would have been impossible. No one would dare to approach the army commander so freely in such a situation. On April 27th, there was a salute in Moscow to celebrate the meeting of the Allies. But there, at the Elba, everyone was trying to surprise each other. The Americans demonstrated tap dance and jazz. As they say, there was a jasmine found urgently among our musicians who could keep up a melody of the overseas colleagues. The Red Army Choir performed the American anthem. A ballet company performed folk dances. This is marvelous, exclaimed Bradley then. Just girls, said Konev with a shrug of his shoulders, the Red Army soldiers. Two weeks later, Bradley himself did not leave the favor unanswered. When Konev paid him a reciprocal visit, a violinist in an ordinary soldier's uniform was part of the cultural program. His playing entranced our marshal. Magnificent. Konev was stunned. Oh, this. Bradley waved his hand carelessly. Nothing much, just one of our American soldiers. Boaster. He kept silent that this soldier was a famous musician whom they brought for a day from Paris to show off in front of those Russians. And Europe itself kept surprising both Americans and Russians. The winners were curious in examining the corner of the earth, which they had finally reached. In the company of my orderly, I often traveled around without any special goal, just to see how people live. And one day near a hamlet, either I ran out of petrol or my motorcycle broke down somewhere, so we stopped. And I came up to that German saying, please let us spend the night at your place. He gave us a small room. In the morning, I took out a banknote intending to pay the host for the night. It was a banknote equal to 100 occupational checks. The man waved his hand saying, Nicht gut, nicht gut. I thought he was being dishonest for he was given 100 checks and it seemed too little for him. He took out a small piece of paper and started writing on it with a pencil, listing the amount of electric energy he had spent on us, how much this and how much that, pointing to our bed and to the window. And there, our motorcycle had been standing in the open air. I looked out of the window. The motorcycle stood there all clean, washed and charged with petrol. Finally, our host wrote down everything, how much the cleaning was and the tidying up and the work itself. All in all, he came up with the amount of only two checks and some fennings. I looked at his calculations thinking of the kind of man he was. I was suggesting him 100 checks and still he calculated all these bits. He took my 100 checks, went away somewhere and brought back the change. This is honesty. Europe, still confused but already breathing the fresh air of freedom, could embarrass, if not seduce, our heroes, who unfortunately had a one-dimensional freedom vision.
and from the very beginning of the historic meetings at the Ilba, they were continuously in the focus of attention of competent authorities of the Soviet and Allied forces as well. Both were afraid of mutual influence, almost uncontrolled in the context of such warm-hearted communication. The confidants of the Generalissimo heard him saying in April 1945, lots of Decemberists will come back from there. The instructions of the Russian command were quite strict, inform the subordinate and demand from them not to show any backslapping or other forms of toadyism with the Allied troops representatives, no initiative in organizing friendly meetings. and no refusing them as well. It is emphasized in the reports of the political bodies that our people are correct at meetings, moderate in drinking, and try to avoid any discussions relating to military secrets. In the same statements, the details are given as to who said something incorrectly and about what. For example, one of our officers suggested the Americans fighting together with the Russians against Japan, and someone was reduced to a lower rank because of that. In the same statement, the command is informed about the attempts of the Americans to embarrass our officers with provocative questions about the future order of things in Berlin, about the attitude towards refugees and prisoners of war. And in the course of the banquet, one of the Soviet commanders tried to ask an American general if his soldiers weren't trenching against us. Entrenching? Certainly not. We are allies after all. Well, about how they behaved. I'll tell you a story. We dropped into a bar to have some beer. You could not find anything to eat at that time in Berlin. But there was plenty of beer. We occupied two tables there. There were some Russian soldiers nearby, too. And in one of the corners, there were Americans, a group of Americans. As always, they were sitting there with their feet up on the table. Drinking beer and smoking. Cigarettes. Well, they had quite a good bit of beer. And so one of the Americans took out a cigarette and hurled it at those soldiers. Not at us, but those soldiers. They stood up and beat them properly. And I told my soldiers, let's go, for the commandants are going to be here shortly. Let's go before they take us as witnesses. We paid for the beer and left. And I don't think it would have been right. Eisenhower wanted a closer contact between the Allies. He suggested creating special groups of communications workers, translators who would facilitate communication both in person and for the exchange of information between the command of the Russian and the British American troops to coordinate combat operations. But Stalin rejected this idea. He wanted to lead his own war, not to consult anybody or coordinate things. The contacts were never direct, but through Moscow. There was a strange feeling that the Russians were, after all, not very good as allies. Not enemies, but not quite on our side. As for our prisoners of war, the Americans used to feed them before letting them go. They provided them with the cuts of fabric for suits, greatcoats, coats, persuaded to stay. Did some recruiting work among our prisoners of war. And they told this to me, those who did this. 
and those who had been recruited. Some stayed, leaving for Canada, America, and Australia. And those who did not agree went to the polar region. This is how it all turned out. Actually, they went away from each other quite quickly. A week, maybe a bit more. The command still continued exchanging visits. But those who had hugged each other on the banks of the Ilba were already on the march. This is a bit hard to express because it happened there just as it had been in the lines. It was just like that. We met for no reason, hugging each other and all that, but it was so, as if we were not at war anymore, but just playing the fool, actually. Just met and hugged each other. You see, the American and that Russian just went to meet each other, without any orders. This was a personal decision. I think they made the end of the war closer by this act. They just did what they felt was right to do. This place has remained the symbol of the possibilities for another world order, where there are no more enemies and everyone is free. Maybe participants recalled later that the meeting at the river was somehow unreal. One could not quite believe that it was actually happening. Josef Polovsky, whom his fellow soldiers considered a dreamer and a castle builder, had kept his feelings for his whole life. Joseph Polovsky. Joseph Polovsky is a taxi driver. His latest occupation took place in Chicago in the beginning of the 80s. In his last will, he asked to be buried in Torgau at the town cemetery. And his fellow soldiers obeyed his will. It means that an ordinary American who was at war and met us there made a will to be buried in the town where we had met. I think this is what he really meant. Shock. Politicians were already determining the areas of influence and established frontiers and traffic control barriers, checkpoints, document check. Agreements were already emerging at these frontiers. They had to tackle a lot of problems, including the people who were left in Europe without a place to live, sometimes without a native country, and those thousands of people whose destinies were still in the hands of the Allies who were steadily turning into bureaucratic occupation authorities. There were still several days before the end of the war and the capitulation. The combat was still on. But this short let up at the banks of a small river signified the end of the war.
and the beginning of victory.